is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Siege and Storm, chapters 10, 11, and 12. In these chapters, Mal begins to calm down a little bit, and Alina realizes that she is going to have to play a role she is not particularly interested in. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Jamie for commissioning this episode. I am unsure what to expect. This is sort of going with like the the thing that I kept thinking of when I was reading these chapters is I think the second book in the Hunger Games trilogy where uh, Katniss is realizing that she is the symbol for the rebellion. <clears throat> Spoilers for Hunger Games, BT Dubs. And she has to do a bunch of like videos and photo ops where they're basically making like rebellion motivation propaganda to put out into the world. And Katniss is like really super not into it. And she recognizes the importance of her role in things. And she is willing to like set aside how she feels about it all, but she's definitely uncomfortable and has to constantly remind herself why this is important and why, even though it feels silly in the moment, why it actually matters. And I just kept thinking about that with Alina. It, it, I feel like with Alina, it's a little bit, it, I think if I were her in comparison to what Katniss does, I would feel a little bit less silly because it's an actual series of interactions with real people that isn't being set to film, that isn't being photographed. So there will not be any like ongoing evidence of her posing with a fucking flag or holding a machine gun or whatever. It's, uh, I think, a little bit easier to be away when you don't feel that there's going to be any lasting record of it. But I still understand Alina's reticence to do this the way that she really needs to do it. Oh, and Jamie's here. Hi, Jamie. Sorry, guys, I'm going to move my mic a little bit. The thing is, Alina wants to have her army. And part of the deal is playing this role. So as much as I really sympathize with feeling like a bit of a fraud, that's kind of part of the package. You know, if you're trying, if you are interested in taking out, and if we're going to say it in the most simplistic terms, she wants to take the Darkling out of the equation. She wants to either kill him or incapacitate him. I am assuming kill, really. That is the thing. And he has such a following behind him that believes in him so much, that feels so compelled by his power and who he is, that they, she has no choice if she wants to fight that than just coming up with her own equal and opposite force, you know? And in order to do that, people have to fight for more than just a cause. It's like there has to be a feeling of unity to that. And that's what leaders are for. And it's super frustrating because if you, for example, in our situation right now, um, talking about the influence that leaders can have and how you kind of don't want them to sometimes, there are times where like the importance of that role, you want to be able to downplay it and say, well, it doesn't matter as long as we have the people, the right people for the job, as long as we have like the backing of the ideology and everybody believes in what we're doing, 
we can't fail, right? But there's we, we outnumber them, we outclass them, whatever. But the truth is, if you are not being led by a person who knows how to handle people, and when I say handle, I say that with a capital H, that that force that you're working with, which you think is just the shoe in for succeed for success and victory, it may not be put to optimal use. And I don't even like admitting that because I don't like to give leaders in my mind, I can be, y'all know me, I can be very defiant. I can be very like, giving a finger to those who are in authority just out of the fucking principle of the thing. I don't like to admit how much that can matter, but it does. Anybody who has worked multiple jobs and especially if you've worked multiple jobs that are very similar and you have had different types of bosses, you know what a difference it makes to have this kind of boss versus that kind of boss. You've been there you know how much that influences the way you see your team, the way you come into work, the attitude that you have when you interact with coworkers and your boss, the attitude you have when shit goes wrong, which it inevitably will. You want to feel like the person in charge understands the basics of the situation because they've been there and thus will be making a smart decision for everybody on the team because they get it. And Alina is starting to really see that with Nikolai, who I'm going to, I've been calling him Sturmhund up until now, but he's pretty much dropped that like identity for this entire section and is just Nikolai. So I've decided I'll just call him that for this section. Oh, Jamie's here. Hi, Jamie. Um, so I really like that gradually she begins to understand where he's coming from because Alina has a lot of contempt initially for the way that he plays crowds and the way that he like just is very invested in the aesthetic of things, the impression of things. And I really, really sympathize with being like, Oh my God, this is all bullshit though. Are you serious? Girl, I get it. It is a hard thing to cope with. I mean, I helped a local woman, try to uh to gain a seat in our like state senate and it was a very small level campaign and it was still really hard to stomach sometimes so i if politics is catering to Oftentimes, if we're being honest, the lowest common denominator, we need to break everything down into easy to absorb sound bites. We need to simplify our message to the point that it can be expressed in a sentence. We need to give the impression the moment that people meet us that we are in charge, that we have the power to do the things that they need us to do, that we are intelligent, but not superior. There is so much that needs to be done. And if you are a genuine person who values the kinds of interactions that you have one-on-one with people and who generally has a hard time like trusting in the public at large, politics is a real fucking like mind fuck. It's just super upsetting to realize how much the major systems in our world hinge upon fabrications or not. If fabrications implies that there's nothing genuine there, but false fronts, we don't like to see how many th- compromises we have to make in order for people to like understand an issue and how much we have to simplify a thing. And we can know if we are well versed in a particular subject or a particular issue, we can know how many nuances there are to the thing. And we can talk about all of the mitigating factors. But you can't do that when you're just trying to go out and have a debate or make a speech. You don't get to delve into all of these little mitigating factors. So 
And that's a mistake that I've seen before as well. At one of the rallies that I held for her, there was a woman who was uh, trying to become a judge and she did this long speech that I found fascinating about the way that the criminal justice system works in our county and how that affects opiate sales because we have an opiate problem here and the ways in which that cycle is perpetuated inside the prison system because of the the way that criminals have figured out to make that work. So getting arrested does not even slow them down. In fact, sometimes they get arrested on purpose. All information that I didn't know, extremely interesting, I thought. I looked around at the crowd, lost. She had lost them. They, it was too much information. And it's crucial information to know if you're going to be voting on this kind of issue. But it was too much. And she lost the thread and she lost their attention. And I don't really remember if she ever got them back. But it was a very disheartening thing to see that, like, unless everybody, every voter is going to be put through a full time education on the history of certain subjects, we are just going to have to do our best with the knowledge that they have and the tiny bits of opportunity that we have to educate them with the basics of an issue. And that is extremely discouraging. And Alina is a person who thrives on being able to make connections with people. She likes having conversations and talking out the different aspects of, well, if we do this, what about this? And if this, then what about this? We it, like, Alina is somebody who is very interested in the details, I feel. And she has trouble trusting people, especially after everything that's happened. And she feels that she stumbled into, I stumbled into it. She feels I was born with this ability purely by chance. It was an accident. And everybody is acting as if, I have this ability because I was chosen by some sort of divine right to have it because I am the one to help. And she does not subscribe to that at all. So listening to people frame her as a saint, as a queen, a goddess even, it makes her really uncomfortable because she knows that she's just a person. However, all that said... I feel like Alina does not really give enough credit to the fact that being the Sun Summoner, whether or not the innate ability is a signal that some some divine entity has tapped her for greatness, whether that's true or not, it has put her in the position to be the only one who has really seen what it is the Darkling intends. She is one of the only people who knows who he really is and what he really wants to do. And everyone else he's kind of lying to, or they don't really care. And they just like are willing to back him because they're sort of frustrated and angry at the world. And because she has that knowledge and she has her own ability it sort of winds up putting her in the position anyway of being the only one who can help. It's, it, it became sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm getting, and you know how I do. I just talk about a thing like way too long. Um, but I'm going to back it up and start with chapter 10. So they go back to Osalta, um, who remember, reminder, they are, on the fold and she is noting how incredibly empty Os Alta is as compared to the last time that they were there where it was a bustling little like town that was you know it, it, it was active and alive and now it's not totally dead it's not abandoned but it is very different. Um, I'm going to read this. 
Not a single Grisha remained at the encampment. After the Darklings attempted coup and the destruction of Nova, Nova Kribirsk, a wave of anti-Grisha sentiment had swept through Ravka and the ranks of the First Army. Some Grisha had fled to Osalta to seek the protection of the king. Others had gone into hiding. Nikolai suspected that most of them had sought out the Darkling and defected to his side, but with the help of Nikolai's rogue squalors, we managed two trips across the fold on the first day, three on the second, and four on the last. Um, and later on, when she's talking about how, like, right near the fold is the most abandoned, and, like, the further away you get, life begins to return to the place... I found that really interesting. And considering that it's growing, that makes sense. Like I keep, I think I last episode was the first time that I really understood that it's expanding and I keep not like holding that in mind. And that's extremely unsettling. Um, meanwhile, Alina is like realizing that, she feels extremely unsteady ever since seeing this vision of the Darkling. And it hasn't happened again. But she's so paranoid about it and really afraid because it completely fucked up her ability to protect everybody. She's solely there because of how she can help keep everyone safe against the Volcra. That's her whole job. And this vision caused her to lose focus completely and somebody died. And yeah, you would be paranoid. You would be extremely worried about that. Um, and Nikolai, for his part, is over here still trying to be like, oh, but can't we hunt Volcra again? And she has to put her foot down and be like, dude, no. And the way that she t like gets him, she tells him, I still feel weak after what happened. I'm not confident enough in our in my power to guarantee. And she's like aware, really, that she's full of shit. She, her power feels very strong. That's not really the issue. But the fear of this thing happening with the Darkling, which she doesn't understand, I think still counts. Because she, she says, like, um, the rest was a lie. And I'm like, is it granted when you say that you're not confident in your power, that's that wording doesn't quite express the same thing. But I feel like that still is true. Like you're not confident that you're going to be able to keep it together because something might happen like last time. And to me, that's still kind of true. I feel like that's that counts. Um, so. Mal, for his part, is staying right next to her because they cross a couple of times and has a gun ready, which I really appreciate. But also knowing that he can't see the thing that she sees, I'm like worried that somehow she's going to wind up shot. You know, like it's just sometimes adding a gun to the equation is the worst possible recipe. Um, he hadn't said much since our argument in the tent. I was afraid that when he did start talking, I wouldn't like what he had to say. And this kind of like initially I got very worried, but then they have a conversation later and Mal actually seems to have calmed down. And I was like, all right, maybe he's reasonable. Maybe it's fine. I, you know, we'll see. But uh, at least in this section, I felt like Mal chilled on being quite such a total asshole. Um, so they head to the capital the next day after, you know, making, moving a lot of stuff over. Um, and she is like feeling sort of hopeful about everything. They're in this procession. The sun is coming up and she's sort of like, all right, you know what? Granted, things aren't super, like, certain right now, but at the very least, I'm not just somewhere fucking hiding from the Darkling doing nothing. I'm being active. We're getting the semblance of a plan together. Maybe it's all, it's all going to be okay. And then when they get to Kribirsk, she and she starts to see how empty this area is as well that feeling of hopefulness begins to ebb a bit. Um, 
And it goes away completely when she spots this church. I remembered it as a tidy building capped by bright blue domes. Now the whitewashed walls were covered in writing, row after row of names written in red paint that had dried to the color of blood. The steps were littered with heaps of withered flowers, small painted icons, the melted stubs of prayer candles. I saw bottles of kvass, piles of candy, the abandoned body of a child's doll, gifts for the dead. I scanned the names. Stepan Rushkin, 57. Anya Serenka, 13. Micah Lasky, 45. Rebecca Lasky, 44. Peter Ozerov, 22. Marina Koska, 19. Valentin Yomki, 72. Sasha Penkin, 8 months. And she starts remembering the moment that these people died and seeing what probably weren't the exact people, but good examples of these people in the crowd trying to run away from the darkness that was like chasing them. And Mal sees her standing here reading these names and tries to get her to come away. And she says, we have to stop him, Mal. We have to find a way. And he doesn't respond. And she feels a little bit of a way about that. She says that she was thinking maybe he doesn't want to make any more promises to me. And maybe that's true. I tend to think maybe f this is the first time that he really understands Alina's position in this because he has been seeing things in my eyes from a very petty perspective the past couple of chapters. You know, he's just really been very small about the way that he is responding to her concerns about stuff and his idea about how they can just run away and live a life somewhere is so foolish and naive and completely untrue. And they have plenty of evidence to back up the fact that that could never work, but he seems unwilling to face that. And I just didn't have much patience for the fact that he doesn't seem to understand what's at stake here. And I kind of wonder if he doesn't answer her here because this is the first time that he really seems to get it. And that would make sense, you know, like it it has been him and Alina and this idea of the darkling, this idea of, you know, Nikolai and the and the forces again for for good and evil. But I feel like Mal has failed to really understand or sympathize with Alina feeling so responsible. It's like it's very easy for him from the outside to be like, this wasn't your fault. You didn't do this. But he doesn't seem to quite like on a visceral level, understand the guilt and the, the underlying like fear of this happening again and it being her fault again, because she's the only one with a counter ability to stop this guy. And I think Mal has been sort of operating under this weird, like faith that maybe Alina goes away and somebody else turns up that has some summoning ability and they are able to save everyone. I think that he just kind of thought if Alina leaves, everything will still work out. Okay. And I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like, it just feels like he doesn't quite comprehend how she's like the only one that could stand up to the darkling. So he's sort of acting as if her taking this upon herself is is overdoing it. Like she's really becoming a martyr voluntarily. And I got the sense in this scene that he's starting to get it a little bit more that genuinely she's it. Nobody else is stepping up. A lot of other Grisha are joining up with the Darkling. If anything, even if there were people who had the ability to go up against him, they aren't really like sh they're showing that they are not interested in helping. And this list of names on this church wall is 
it goes on and on and it's just going to get longer if the shit continues to go on. So they continue writing after this. She makes herself read every name. And as they get into the more settled area of town, there's a guy who yells out the name Alina and she thinks that he knows her and is about to turn around and try and talk to him. And this moment is so annoying. Um, Nikolai is stopping her from turning around. And it's like one of those, those conversations that I keep on, this sort of continues to be a reminder to me that Lee Bardugo is still figuring out her writing because she'll have these moments of Alina like, and another person failing to communicate effectively and Alina getting angry over nothing. And this moment with Nikolai, like he doesn't come up to her and be like, Hey, no, he's not calling you by your name. He's saying your name because he's selling something that's related to the sun summoner. That's just like, he doesn't know you. That would be a very simple thing to say, but instead he's just real weird about it. She's like, he knew me. No, he didn't. He knew my name. Um, and finally, he says he was trying to sell you relics, finger bones, genuine sancta Alina. And I'm like, I get that that isn't something that you just wanted to blurt out, but you could explain it another way. They fight over the reins and she keeps trying to like yank herself away from him. And just like that, like there's a bit of a back and forth here. And I'm just like, this could have been avoided. You guys fight too much over silly nonsense. You all have to conserve your energy a little bit more. Um. And Nikolai is like, yeah, people think you died. So they think that your bones are good luck charms. And that's what he's claiming to be selling. Um, and it says the optimism I'd felt only an hour ago had vanished. It suddenly seemed as if the sky were pressing down on me, closing in like a trap. I kicked my horse into a canter. I'd always been a clumsy rider, but I held on tight and did not stop until Krybirsk was far behind me and I no longer heard the rattling of bones. So the next night, Nikolai's regiment shows up and she notices how much he sort of relaxes when he is around familiar people. Uh, he'd transitioned effortlessly from the role of glib adventurer to arrogant prince. And now he became a beloved commander, a soldier who laughed easily with his companions and knew each commoner's name. Um, and this is something that's extremely important. And I think it's an interesting, uh, well, you know, what? I'm getting ahead of myself because there's a thing that happens a little bit later. So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so she has to like all of them are eating in public because Nikolai is he encourages a sense of community among everyone because he wants to feel like he is making himself available and he wants everyone else to have a sense of him being one of them rather than keeping himself separate and eating alone in his room or Alina being separate. He doesn't want people to believe that they think they're better than them or don't appreciate the risk they're all taking. And I think that makes a ton of sense. Um, Alina, for her part, is still at this point frustrated. She says, I didn't realize winning the people meant meeting every single one of them. Aren't we in a hurry? He says, Ravka needs to know it. Sun Summoner has returned. Um, and he says that Basically, they, we can make like a big pronouncement, but going around and letting you be seen, that stokes gossip and gossip is extremely powerful. That shit will travel way faster than a pronouncement will. Um, and he says, from here on out, you need to behave as if someone is watching every minute. He gestured between me and Mal with his fork. What you do in private is your own affair. Just be discreet. And... Alina at this point is disgusted and this I really was impatient with her over because they've made it clear like they talked before about how it, it, and granted there was a, a moment where it was like Nikolai trying to be like well you could marry me and then you could still be with Mal like on the side 
But even if she's not with Nikolai and saying that she's going to be his queen, I really assumed that she knew she can't be with Mal either. That's not how that works. That whole like image. She can't be doing that. And I thought that she got that. And it frustrated me so much to have her like arguing that's nobody's business. I'm like, bitch. Yeah, it is now, though. You are a major public figure. That is not private anymore. Like, there may be a point at which you have earned privacy again, and you still are a public figure. But that takes a lot of time. You can't like, gain people's support while doing whatever the fuck you feel like. First, you gain everybody's support. You prove that you deserve it a couple of times. And then you begin to do whatever you want. That's how that goes. But she doesn't get that at all. Um, and then he tells her that she needs to get her own colors. And she's very like, because she's already irritated about him talking about Mal, she tries to dig her heels in on this a little bit. And I was like, on the one hand, I understood her mindset because I can be this way also. But on the other hand, he makes a really good point. She needs a brand. She needs to work on her brand. And what they decide to go with is a blue that's shot through with a bunch of gold. I don't know why they didn't just go with white. Is there another one of the uh, Grisha that wears white already? Um, I, I can't remember if that is somebody's or not. But I just really feel like that's the way to go. B b white and gold. And your sunlight. I mean, come on. It just, it's just, it's right there. And I found it weird that like, oh, I'm just going to wear the same color as all the other summoners. That's the point is that you're supposed to have your own color. You do a thing that is very specific and is not like any of the others. That's why he's saying you need your own colors. I don't know. I just found that like frustrating and it just seems like she's not understanding the point to this stuff. You know, Jamie says she identifies with a group that wears blue. Yeah, but like, it's not about what she identifies with. That's not what this should be about anymore. And I just don't understand how she hasn't caught up yet to the fact that that is what she feels is beside the point. She's going to be in public commanding an army and she has to set herself apart from all the other Grisha the way that the Darkling has set himself apart. She unfortunately needs to kind of use what the Darkling's done as a model for herself. And she just seems totally like fucking behind on everything about how this works. Nikolai suggests gold. And I was thinking white, but like, you know, gold would still work. Um, she says that it would be tacky. And I was like, I mean, maybe, but who cares? Um, she tries to say bl uh, gold and black and Mal says no black. And I mean, I don't know if Mal gets a say, but I tend to agree using the same color that the darkling is using seems like a really bad idea. I mean, that just shouldn't, shouldn't even be an option. Um, however, I mean, I just, I really think white is it. That's just, it's just no question to me. And I found it extremely strange that white isn't even mentioned, you know? And again, I don't think there's a Grisha that has white already. So there's no real reason I can think of why she doesn't choose that one. Maybe they'll change it. Maybe she'll use white later, but as of right now, I'm just kind of like, come on, it's, it's fucking, that's easy. Um, so Nikolai says that she sh not only should choose the color for herself, but she needs to choose a color for herself and her guards. And she asks if she really needs guards. And this is really one of those moments where I'm just like, oh my God, girl. Do you really need guards? Are you high right now? Where are you? Where's your head? They, like, there comes a point with a character that's a main character where 
you know, you need somebody within a scene to ask questions so that another person will answer them and the audience gets their answer because somebody needs to be the idiot in the scene sometimes. But this is a moment where I'm just like, we all know we don't need an explanation of why you need guards. Like, obviously, of course, you, what do you, girl, um, Jamie says, did the servants wear white when Genya was a servant to the king and queen? Did she wear white? I thought she wore yellow, but I could be wrong about that. Um, mm, I don't remember. So Nikolai asks her how, if she knows how he got the name Sturmhond. And she, he tells her a story. The first enemy ship I ever boarded was a Fjordan trader out of Jer Dersholm. When I told the captain to lay down his sword, he laughed in my face and told me to run home to my mother. He said Fjordan men make bread from the bones of skinny Ravkin boys. I told him foolish old captains weren't fit meat for Ravkin men. Then I cut off his fingers and fed them to my dog while he watched. And she's just sitting there staring at him like, what in the fuck? And he says, my enemies understood brutality and so did my crew. After it was over, I drank with my men and divvied up the spoils. Then I went back to my cabin, vomited up the very fine dinner my steward had prepared and cried myself to sleep. But that was the day I became a real privateer, and that was the day Sturmhond was born. I was a boy, trying to lead an undisciplined crew of thieves and rogues against enemies who were older, wiser, and tougher. I needed them to fear me. All of them. And if they hadn't, more people would have died. And she says, whose fingers are you telling me to cut off? And he says, I'm telling you, if you want to be a leader, it's time you started thinking and acting like one. And he is absolutely correct. Like, look, it's an unpleasant thing to have to do. But if she is determined to stop the Darkling, if she is determined to lead this army, that's part of the deal. You don't get to pick. Sorry, girl. That's how that falls out. And I just don't really see the point in fucking whining about it. You know, it sucks. What can you do? That's the job. Um, so then they have the journey like through some villages and whatnot. And they, she has like a moment where she's like arguing with him about making a showing uh, he says the people love you and she says they love your prize goat. And she says, this isn't funny. These people will be sending their sons and daughters off to fight and I won't be able to save them. You're feeding them a lie. And like, that's not necessarily true. You just haven't gotten a chance to like experiment yet. And also you haven't gotten your third amplifier. And also that's part of what he was explaining to you is like being a good leader will keep people from, from as many people from dying. Um, but anyway, so as, as things continue, uh, she has her little chat with Mal and he says that he wants to be on her guard. And there's a bit of a cute back and forth. I say cute. It's a, uh, it's like the kind of thing that I recognize is supposed to be cute, but I feel like the banter between her and Mal has lost some of its zest for me, possibly just because I feel like irritated at Mal a lot of the time now. Um, and she says, I thought you might want to go back to your unit. And he's like, oh, I can't do that. I am a deserter. They will hang me. That's not an option at all. And he's sort of like, expresses some concern over whether or not she might begin to fall for this prince because he says, I never saw him like manage. I never saw anybody manage people the way that he does. He works a crowd. It's insane. And he's also extremely good looking. I'm not an idiot. I know that I, yeah, I'm a little bit worried about it. And she tries to reassure him, 
But later on, Nikolai kisses her. And he does it and the whole crowd goes wild. They love the whole thing. It's like this big moment. And she is so mad. He manages to kiss her right before sort of shoving her into the carriage. And that way nobody gets to see her reaction to this whole thing. But I did really appreciate that Mal isn't mad at her. I thought that this might turn into a thing where Mal was like, going to insinuate that she had been in on it or that she liked it or whatever. And instead he just kind of is like, well, first of all, I kind of want to kill him. And second of all, you didn't feel anything like that's a reasonable question. He was being mature about it finally. And she reassures him that she did not feel anything. And I like that she didn't like, it doesn't, it, this isn't one of those moments of just like, well, I told him no, trying to ignore that flutter in my heart. Like, no, it does not feel that she felt anything. And I am relieved that she can say that and be dead ass honest with him. And I just really appreciate that he seems to believe her. And it's not this whole thing. When she tells him that she kicked Nikolai, he appreciates that and believes that that happened. Um, so... I'm trying to see there's the conversation about the Grisha and whether or not they are divine. Um, and to, she asks Tamar, like, you don't think that I'm a saint, do you? And Tamar says, it doesn't matter. All that matters is what you can do. Those people think you can save Ravka. Obviously you do too, or you wouldn't be going to Osalta. And she says, I'm trying to rebuild the second army. And Tamar says, and find the third amplifier. And she's like, oh, what? How? I didn't even think that anybody else knew about that. I thought it was just us three. And Tamar's like, mm, we know. Like, not everybody. It's like the inner circle. But yeah, we know what's going on here. And we're trying to help. This is like part of the deal. Um, And... I just, I, I rather liked this like discussion of whether or not the Grisha are favored by the gods or what. I think this is a natural sort of conversation to have happen when people, when some people are given these gifts and other people aren't, you know? Um, so let's see, we have the kiss scene and obviously the crowd ships the two of them. It seems like this is a common thing. Um, and she, he begins to give her some lessons in how to be a leader. The less you say, the more weight your words will carry. Don't argue. Never deign to deny. Meet insults with laughter. Weakness is a guise. Wear it when they need to know you're human, but never when you feel it. Don't wish for bricks when you can build from stone. Use whatever or whoever is in front of you. Being a leader means someone is always watching you. Get them to follow the little orders and they'll follow the big ones. It's okay to flout expectations, but never disappoint them. All very good advice. You know, this all feels right in line. Um, and <laughs> this, this, Flout, but don't disappoint is like, I mean, that's a good way to live your life, honestly, even if you're not a leader, but it certainly is easier said than done. That's one of those things that I'm like, well, yeah, if you can manage it, fucking duh. Um, so then we have the moment where they begin to approach the palace. Um, they, well, oh, first of all, I forgot about this. They have their dinner with the count. And I forgot about this whole thing because she, this is like one of the first times that she is kind of at a court function as this new representative of the opposing force against the Darkling. And so she is being expected to play a role here and she's not used to it. She's not really paying attention. She's not even doing a good job of pretending to pay attention. She isn't enjoying the conversation. She doesn't feel like she belongs to this set of people. 
that in particular is something that I identify with a lot because I feel like every kind of like demographic, there was a big part of me that didn't quite fit. Um, being around white people, I was very aware that I wasn't entirely white. Being around Hispanic people, I was very aware that I didn't speak Spanish and didn't feel – when I was in the suburbs with a lot of kids that had money, knowing that I didn't have any made me feel very separate from all of that. Like it was just like a lot of moments in my life of just being like, there's a big factor here in this gathering that I don't have. And she's just, you know, being put in this position – well, not being – she's choosing to be in this position – that is requiring her to rub elbows with a certain set and class of people that she just doesn't identify with at all. And that's a really tricky thing to get used to. You have to kind of fake it and pretend that you belong or tell yourself you belong until you're done, you know? Um, so eventually she like says that she has a headache and begins to head back to her room uh, for the night and Nikolai has to stop her and be like dude come on you can't just bail this early you really need the practice like this is how it's gonna be and she kind of is like all right look I, I I swear I'll be better but I did pretty well tonight just let me have this man just let me duck out and he kind of admits like all right I will and maybe I'm just a little annoyed because I would also very much like to leave and I can't so fine um and this is when she goes into the garden and talks with Mal and she gives him the, uh, this sun burst pin. Um, she says that she doesn't want uniforms that she wants everybody to have something that they wear that identifies them, but she didn't want them to be wearing something that looked like, the uh, Oprichniki, I hope I'm saying correctly, the Darklings people. Um, so he says, is that all? And she's like, what do you mean? And he says, I was promised a cape and a fancy hat. And then he kisses her and they have this moment. I don't think they've had sex yet still. And I'm just like, y'all need to just fucking do it already. I don't know. Maybe they have, though. Um, but they are interrupted by tomorrow, Tamar. There's a group of people at the gate demanding entry. They want to see the sun summoner. And the, 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 it's got a real like feel to it here that somebody is about to come in and start a fight. And it's fed your guys help me out. I do not remember Fedjor. Am I supposed to remember Fedjor? She says, he saved my life. Fedjor had once put himself between me and a swarm of Fjerdin assassins. Did I read about this? Is this something that happened? I remember none of this. I have no idea who this is. Like, I feel bad because obviously she knows who the fuck he is. But I just, oops, you know, um, and they're, the thing is that he's a Grisha and he has some other Grisha with him. And the Grisha, because a lot of them like defected to the Darkling side, are not exactly being looked on kindly these days. So they get sort of like ushered into a separate area where they're kept watch over. And on the one hand, I understand that. And on another hand, I'm like, well, that's really discouraging. Like your own people are just looked on as being traitors right out of the gate until they're, it's proven otherwise. Um, so then the final chapter, this is where I, what I was talking about with uh, the meeting of the reception crew, I guess, um, they are – this is when you really get to see Nikolai sort of stretch his limbs and and work his magic. Um, between us and the capital, arrayed in perfect military formation, stood row after row of armed men, hundreds of soldiers of the First Army, maybe a thousand. Sunlight glittered off the hilts of their swords and their backs bristled with rifles. 
A man rode out before them. He wore an officer's coat covered with medals and sat atop one of the biggest horses I'd ever seen. Uh, and Nikolai says, oh, my brother has come to greet us. So they come, you know, trotting up. And she is looking at Nikolai in the situation as his brother approaches and realizes how young Nikolai is and starts to be a little bit doubtful on whether he's going to be able to handle this or not. Um, and I love this moment. This, his brother starts with, so this is the girl you claim is the sun summoner, which is a really bad way to start. A, like her, his brother is not thinking tactically because he's just giving Nikolai the exact moment to show off that he needed. Um, and this is when that his brother's name is Vasily. Um, I think I'm saying that correctly. He says, uh, when I heard you were returning home, I wanted to be here to greet you. He says, the return of a royal prince is no small thing, even a younger son. And I'm just like, all right, he knows. I mean, come on. And Nikolai says, we younger sons learn to appreciate what we can get. Then he called to a soldier standing at attention down the line. Sergeant Petchkin. I remember you from the Helmheld campaign. Leg must have healed well if you're able to stand there like a slab of stone. The sergeant's face registered surprise. Da, Moitsarevich, he said respectfully. Sir, will do, sergeant. I am an officer when I wear this uniform, not a prince. Vasily's lips twitched again. Like many noble sons, he had taken an honorary commission and done his military service in the comfort of the officer's tents, well away from enemy lines. But Nikolai had served in the infantry. He'd earned his medals and rank. Yes, sir, said the sergeant. Only bothers me when it rains. Then I imagine the Fjerdens pray daily for storms. You put quite a few of them out of their misery, if I recall. I seem to remember you doing the same, sir, said the soldier with a grin. I almost laughed. In a single exchange, Nikolai had seized control of the field from his brother. Tonight, when the soldiers gathered in the taverns, this, me this was what they would be talking about. The prince who remembered an ordinary soldier's name. The prince who had fought side by side with them without concern for wealth or pedigree. This is such a great moment because it is obviously a ploy on Nikolai's part, but it also feels really natural. Like, it's not like he knew they'd be here. He doesn't have a secretary with a stack of photos prepping him for the people that he's going to see. He saw this guy and genuinely re rem remembered his name, remembered his face, remembered what the injury was that he had, remembered the way the guy fought. Yes, he's using that, but None of that is faked. He didn't just, you know, type the guy's name behind his back into his phone into fucking, you know, Facebook and then check. This is all genuinely stuff that he remembers. So, sure, it might be a political maneuver to use it, but that is also a true reflection of who Nikolai is. And I know, like, for me, a lot of people have mentioned, like, the difference between the way that I work with the podcast versus other podcasters who they support and whose groups they're in. They said that they are always surprised that I am, that I have such a like personal relationship with a lot of listeners that I know people and remember their comments and stuff. I try, it's not easy and I don't do super well. That happens a lot, but I think that counts for something. People just want to know that they're not another faceless nobody. You know, and I don't, I want to feel that way also. So I just really like this and th things continue on in this vein with him just managing the situation over and over again and instructing Alina and Mal to a degree because he like puts out in the, uh, amongst the troops, the story of how like Mal stood up against the Darkling and whatnot. He is trying to sow seeds of camaraderie 
and bonds with, you know, between people and make it so that they trust Mal, even if they don't know him super well, by using that sort of information to lay the groundwork for his reputation. And I just think it's just really smart. I really enjoy Nikolai. Nikolai is everything that I like want Alina to become. And she's just digging in her heels so much because she doesn't trust him. And that's fine to not trust him, but you can't deny the results of his like his methods. So you don't have to trust the person to trust the methodology. Um, so I only have a few minutes left, but we have the meeting between them all and the king and queen. First, the king and queen have this like rather emotional moment greeting Nikolai. And they, the king has been very ill. And Nikolai says something at one point about how smart the darkling was because it was Ginya who poisoned him. We're using the word poisoned in quotes because we don't know exactly what she did. But he's like, yeah, if he had outright killed the king, that would have been a fucking problem. But to just make him really ill so that he was like hidden from people and nobody knew exactly what was going on. That was smart. It made things like uncertain. It made everybody sort of like there was no forward movement for a little while because nobody quite understood what was happening and the king wasn't admitting how sick he was. So there was a real delay in that. He just really handled that pretty well. And it's like this grudging respect. And so the king is still not doing super well. He doesn't look well. And when Nikolai is greeted by all of them, the king finally says, come and pulls him away. And Mal and Alina are left standing there because of this very, this is like a formal, you know, they're meeting royalty. They're not going to be announced the way that Nikolai is, but there is like a certain ceremony to it. And they are not allowed to proceed if the king and queen leave. So they just have to stand there incredibly awkwardly for like 40 minutes until the king and queen and the two princes come back. And Alina can tell after looking at the expression on their faces, the king is beaming, seems very full of pride. The queen is pale and looks very worried. And Vasily looks angry as fuck. And she notices that Nikolai seems to have relaxed. And she thinks, oh, he's told them who he is, that he's Sturmhond. And that's interesting. That was a surprising thing for me to think that, like, for her to make that assumption. And I'm fine with that. But I just, that was not where my mind went. Um, so the king comes up to Alina. And he basically is like, Oh, you want to lead the second army, huh? First of all, you're very young. Second of all, I don't know that you're not working for the Darkling and I kind of want to kill you. But my my son says that it'd make you a martyr. I don't know. I guess I won't. But I've got my eye on you and I do not trust you. And I he kind of has a similar thing with Mal where... Because Mal is a deserter, the, you know, what they would normally do is execute. And he finally says, I will allow you to be dishonorably discharged. Mal says, I did what I thought was right, but I imagine every man thinks his reasons are good. It was still desertion. And... Alina's sort of like, dude, I, 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 I respect the fact that you're being honest here, but now is not the fucking time. Can you not just for like a second? Um, but yeah, what's one more viper in the nest? You will be dishonorably discharged. And Alina is like real angry about that. But Mal is like, honestly, I knew this is how it was going to work. Like the fact that they decided not to kill me is pretty much what I could expect. But she can tell, even as he's saying that, that he was hoping it would work out better. And she's frustrated at the fact that she doesn't have the power to, like, improve his situation for him. Um, so the chapter ends with her saying to herself, I took a deep breath 
Nikolai had done what he could. Now it was my turn. So maybe she can, she can improve the situation after all. I guess we'll see. But, uh, yeah, I don't actually, oh, I closed the book. I, um, I know that I'm about a third of the way in, I think, by now. And I'm really wondering how this is going to work because there's another book after this one. So I'm assuming things don't wrap up by the end of this book, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, so I don't know what to expect. I really don't. Like, I am super enjoying Nikolai, though. So I look forward to seeing more of him and low key do kind of want Alina to marry him. I like ship them a tiny bit, just a tiny bit, just because Mal's annoying. And that's about it. All right, everybody. Thank you again so, so much for listening. Thank you to Jamie for commissioning this episode. And I will see you soon with a new one. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.